Hello, and welcome to the dungeon. I'm your host, Rob. Today we're going to be continuing our series of cleric spells. This is going to be part two in the series, and we're going to be looking at third, fourth, and fifth level cleric spells. And just like part one, we're not going to go through every spell available. I'm just going to be talking about the ones that I think are good, some of the ones that I think are maybe situational, but still pretty useful. We'll probably talk about a few of the things, a few of the ones that I think are maybe not so good or overrated. And we're going to be including some Tasha spells because we get some pretty nice ones in this spell level range. So, you know, more spells is always good too. So let's just start things off right at level 3. We have Animate Dead. Um, I love this spell. The fact that there's no concentration, the fact that the undead lasts quite a while, these are both big pluses. But you can also use them in so many different ways. Like, yeah, you can just use them to help your party fight and to help, you know, bolster your forces a little, right? You can also use them for scouting, you know, if you're worried there might be traps in the hallway, send the skeletons and zombies in ahead, and if there's a pit trap, better the zombie hits it than you, or like a spear trap, or a poison arrow trap, or a fireball in the face trap, or a crushing stone that destroys everything beneath it trap, definitely better that, that hits the skeletons and zombies than you. So either way, the lack of concentration, the long duration, the versatility of the spell, all really good things. Next, Dispel Magic. This is just one of those spells that somebody in the party probably needs to have because it's just so handy and so useful in so many different situations. And you could leave it to the wizard to try to cast. Nothing wrong with that. But to be fair, he probably has to, you know, reserve a spot for Counterspell. So you might as well do the Dispelling. You can do the Counterspelling. Mass Healing Word. This is a great spell. It can turn a potential TPK and help you like revive everybody and reset the fight and hopefully stabilize and maybe turn things around and still get a win. The fact that you can revive multiple party members at once, that it's a range, that it's a bonus action, these things are all amazing. However, that all being said, I do find that I usually just use Healing Word a lot more often. And that tends to be because it's very common that like, one person in the party goes down, like maybe the fighter gets crit twice in one round and just drops like a rock, right? That happens sometimes, just bad luck or whatever. But it's a lot more rare that like say two or three party members go down at once, the cleric wasn't one of them, and that he's able to then use, you know, mass healing word to get them all back up into the fight. And the truth is that if you just want to use it to like top people off, it's not the best for that because his healing is still really low. You're usually better off reviving multiple downed allies in one round. And that does happen sometimes. Not saying it doesn't happen. You know, maybe you get hit by a fireball or a dragon breath weapon and your cleric made a saving throw but everybody else failed, right? That's a pretty tough situation and you can't really afford to just cast healing word and use a healer kid and try to spend like two or three rounds reviving everybody like you're in serious trouble in this situation right so it can really turn the tides of battle in those kind of in that kind of spot but overall well really really good i find that i don't use it as often as you might think you do uh revivify i absolutely love this spell if i'm a life cleric and then i have it on my domain list and i don't need to prepare it Otherwise, I still really like it, and I kind of need to have it, but I also hope that I never need to cast it, and that's always a rough spot to be in. And I know it might be tempting to say, eh, do I really need it though? But I can tell you from personal experience, we had a party, and we were either level 5 or 6, because the cleric had revivify, did not have a spell slot for it, or either, either that, or didn't have it prepared at all, and uh... Turned out somebody died and we needed Revivify and he had a lot of unhappy party members when they were like, wait, you could have cast a spell and, you know, yeah, that was not good. Not good situation. So, you know, don't be that guy. If you're the cleric, try to have Revivify. Next is Spirit Guardians and this spell is just pure awesomeness. The fact that it does decent damage, not great damage, but decent, although it scales very well, so there is that. But it's persistent damage, and it has that like difficult terrain effect. You get to choose who's affected and who isn't. So you can just hit all the enemies, not your allies. It scales fairly well, like I said, and it's just a great spell. And it's pretty good even if you're a ranged cantrip type cleric, but it's even better if you're like a frontline plate-wearing cleric, you know? And there's a lot of them these days that could wear heavy armor, you know? 
So I think that it's really, really great. And like I said, the damage isn't super high at earlier levels. Like if you compare it to say like a fireball, which is just straight damage, right? You know, party hits level five, you have spirit guardians, the wizard has fireball. Fireball is just a, a counter ending spell. He casts fireball in the room, everything probably dies if it fails the saving throw. I mean, even if it makes a saving throw, some of them might die. Like fireball is excellent. But the problem is that fireball just doesn't do a lot of damage at higher levels. Like it, even if you upscale it, it kind of scales like this and monster hit points scale like that. So it just doesn't keep up. But because Spirit Guardians does the persistent damage at round after round after round, because it has the movement and pairing effects and other things like this, you can just get so much more mileage out of it. And I think it's just an, an excellent spell for clerics. It also fits really well into your play style, especially if you're like a frontline type cleric, right? Where you could be, you know, you, round one you cast the Spirit Guardians and wade up into the battle, right? And then you know, round two, you're attacking with your weapon while concentrating on spirit guardians and maybe even throwing out like a spiritual weapon. And now that's using your bonus action because that, that doesn't need concentration. So your bonus action is your spiritual weapon. Your main action is your attack weapon or your cantrip or whatever other action you wanted to take, right? And then meanwhile, you're concentrating on spirit guardians still and it's just doing damage round after round after round. It's snaring things and having their movement round after round after round. It's just a great spell. Uh, we got a couple new ones added to the spell list from Tasha's. One was Aura of Vitality, which is formerly a Paladin spell only. Um, this is a great, great spell for healing up, especially for healing after a combat, but even in combat, it's pretty good. The reason I say I like it even better after combat, though, is it's great in those situations where maybe you don't know if you have time for a short rest, you know? Like you're in a dungeon, you have a difficult fight, everybody's kind of beat up, and you're like, I, I don't even know if it's safe to rest, you know? But I could use one third of a spell slot, that's 10 rounds of healing at two dice six per round. That's 20 dice six of healing in the course of one minute. That's a lot of healing. And you know, it's concentration, right? But if you're not in combat, you don't have to worry about it. But like I say, even in combat, it's a pretty nice heal. Just every round, throwing out those two dice six. Oh, you get two dice six. Next round, you get two dice six. You get two dice six. Everybody gets two dice six, right? Uh, great, great spell. The next one I want to talk about from Tasha's is Spirit Shroud. There we go. I forgot what it's called. Uh, I think this is a great spell, but I do think that it's probably not as good on clerics as it is on some of the other options because it also appears on the Paladin spell list and it's on the Warlock spell list. And I think in both those cases, like especially if you're a Pact of the Blade Warlock, you're gonna have two attacks around. Paladin, you're gonna have two attacks around, right? So the fact that it's enchanting your weapon with this extra bonus damage and that every round you're able to do that damage, it just applies more if you have more attacks, right? So it's probably better on somebody who has extra attack. That said, it is a bonus action to cast, it's more damage, and you know, maybe you're playing like a war cleric and you've got that bonus action attack. Round one, you cast your spirit shroud as your bonus action and then you attack and get that extra damage. And then all the subsequent rounds, you make your main attack, use your bonus action attack, and now you're just getting in that extra damage. That can be really, really solid, right? And it's not like a hunter's mark or a hex where I'm having to use my bonus action to move it around from target to target. Right? It's just on me, it's on my weapon. And now every time I hit, it's just doing that damage. And that is really, really good. But like I said, I do find it's probably better on the more martial type of classes, but still worth mentioning. Uh, a couple of spells I think are situational, but both very, very useful, are Remove Curse and Speak With Dead. And both of these, but especially Remove Curse, can be used kind of reactively, I'm just gonna say, right? So you might not even need to have it prepared. This is one of the great things about Remove Curse. Most of the curse effects that you can remove are pretty bad and you want them gone. But they're also not like lethal or immediately fatal. So if you don't have it prepared, you can be like, hey, I'm gonna take a long rest. I'm gonna swap this out with a different spell. And in the morning, I'm gonna cast Remove Curse. That's usually perfectly fine. And then your next long rest, you just take it back out again, right? And you know, that's great. I like the fact that it's a situational spell that when I need it, I can use it, but I don't have to have it prepared that exact second or else something terrible is gonna happen, right? That's the best way to have a situational spell. 
Uh, Speak with Dad is great for like murder investigation type stories and for like thing, so, things of that nature. Or even, you know, maybe your party is just out in the wilderness. You find some village that's all been burnt to the ground and all the villages have been slaughtered and murdered. And you decide to cast Speak with Dead on a couple of them and find out what happened, right? It's really good for those kind of things. There are some restrictions, like the answers are cryptic. You can only ask five questions. You can't cast it more than once on the same corpse every like two weeks, I think it is, something like that. So, you know, be aware there it's not always as handy as you might want. But overall, pretty good spell. Uh, the last one I wanted to mention is Glyph of Warding. And I have I've used this spell in the past quite successfully, but I gotta be honest. It has a 200 gold piece component, which is consumed in the cast. So basically it's 200 gold per cast. You know, uh, and that's a lot of money. And it does have a couple different effects. You can either use it to, to blow up and do some damage, nothing wrong with that. Or you can use it to cast a spell for you that targets like an area or a single creature, right? And doesn't use your concentration though. So you could like try to prepare an area where you have your glyph and it's hidden and then you lure the enemies in there and maybe you cast like a silence 15 foot radius or something on that area, right? And now the spellcasters suddenly find they can't cast spells and they get ambushed and you know, your party's able to clean up, right? Things like that can be pretty handy sometimes, but that is a lot of preparation. I find that it's pretty good in scenarios where I know a fight is coming, right? Like maybe you have one of those defend the town for, you know, 24 hours until the king and his army can arrive to, you know, help the town and relieve the siege kind of thing, right? Then you can cast on the front gates of the city or something along those lines, right? And it can be pretty handy in those situations. And the damage isn't bad on it either. Like, it's not like it's a bad spell. It's just the fact that you have to have it prepared, the fact that it's expensive to cast, there are some serious limitations to it. But either way, I wanted to mention it. Moving on to level four, and hopefully picking up the pace a little. Uh, number one, banishment. This is one of those all-or-nothing spells. I kind of have mixed feelings on those spells. They tend to be very, very powerful, but they also tend to be like super hit or miss, right? If they make the saving throw, then you just did nothing except for waste your turn and a spell slot, and uh, that's not great. Also, less likely, but still a possibility. What if the thing has legendary saving throws and you know, even if it does fail a save, it's just like, oh, actually, I'm just going to use a legendary save and retroactively pass, you know? Uh, not great for there either. The fact, though, that you can, like, remove a combatant from the fight entirely is pretty good. Like, that is uh, that is very strong for fourth level spell, and it scales really well. So I think you use this, like, a fifth or sixth level spell, where maybe you can hit three targets, and if one of them fails, I'm feeling like, okay, I wasn't bad. If two fail, I'm feeling pretty good. Like, two out of three, you're like, okay, this fight just became a cakewalk, probably, right? Uh, it's also pretty nice against, like, things like fiends and celestials and stuff where you can banish them and then they can be permanently gone if you maintain concentration for the full minute, right? But I do, do want to caution you that a lot of fiends and celestials tend to have magic resistance, so it's going to be making that saving throw with advantage. And if it passes, then you just did nothing except for waste your action, right? But still, it can be handy. It's also nice, uh, in one party I was with, we had to try to talk to the Dwarven King, but the guards didn't want to let us in. We were trying to save the King's life. We're kind of on a timer here, people. And of course, the guards being difficult. So one of the party members just decided to banish the guards. And then, you know, we don't have to kill the guards. They're just banished. They both failed the saving throws, both gone. We're able to go in there and help save the King, right? And now we don't have to deal with it. And the guards will come back and, you know, they'll be fine, right? So, you know, it's always easier to ask forgiveness than permission, that kind of thing. Uh, Death Ward. Death Ward's pretty handy. I think it was actually even better in previous editions. But nowadays, like, there's a lot of way, or a lot of classes and subclasses that maybe have, like, these, you know, if you're reduced to zero hit points but not killed out, right, you can choose to stay at one hit point, which is basically what Death Ward would, would have done, right? But like half orcs get as a racial, a lot of barbarians have that ability. I'm not saying that it's not still a good spell, just saying that there are other ways that people can get it. And, you know, but still, it might be nice to use on yourself. You probably didn't make a half orc cleric. I mean, maybe you did, but. 
saying. Yeah. Uh, I think it's excellent on, say, like a paladin at higher levels, where you could use your find greater steed, and if you cast a spell on yourself while riding the steed, the steed also gets the death ward. And then if you're flying in the air with your griffin, and he takes a bunch of damage from a dragon, and he doesn't just instantly die and send you plummeting to your death with him, he goes to one hit point instead. Maybe you can perform an emergency landing still. So I think it's really good in that situation. Uh, freedom of Movement. Really nice spell. Hopefully one you don't have to use a lot, but when you need it, you kind of need it right then. So definitely worth having. I like Stone Shape a lot. Stone Shape is one where a lot of times in dungeons you might have like certain traps or tricks or like doors that are magically sealed and you can't open them and, unless you have the right spells and maybe you just don't or whatever the case might be, right? Being able to just like carve a giant hole in the wall and go through that instead, pretty handy. <laughs> um, maybe you just carve a hole, hole in the floor and drop down to the next level of the dungeon. Why not, you know? Basically, this spell is kind of limited by your imagination in a lot of ways and whatever your DM will let you get away with doing with it. And, uh, you know, that's a good thing to have. Lots of room for abuse. Um, Guardian of Faith is one that I'd consider more of a situational spell. But the Guardian does do pretty good damage. The big problem with him is that he's kind of limited to the area you summon him in. He can move like 20 feet or whatever it is, something like that. But basically, he's confined to whatever that area is. However, he doesn't need concentration and he lasts eight hours. So he is really good. Like if you're gonna take a long rest and you have a fourth level spell slot, you're just gonna get back anyway when you finish that rest. Might as well drop a spirit guardian, take your long rest, have the guardian protect you while you're asleep. And like I said, you'll get the spell slot back anyway. So no, nothing lost, right? And I think it's really good for those situations. And like I said, the guardian does really good damage too. Uh, it's just a shame that unlike, say, Anime Dead, the Guardian can't follow you through the dungeon, he can't scout for traps, he can't do a lot of that other stuff. But, still pretty good to have. Uh, Tasha's gave us a couple spells from the Paladin spell list again. Aura of Life and Aura of Purity. Aura of Life, I don't think is very good. Um, gives you and your party the resistance and necrotic damage, your hit point maximum can't be reduced. And if a non-hostile living creature regains one hit point when it starts to turn in the area, if it would have started with zero. So if one of your companions goes down, they automatically start with one hit point again on their turn, which allows them to get back up in the fight. Not terrible, but like if I know for sure that we're going to be fighting a lot of like undead and they're doing necrotic damage and maybe they're going to be draining hit point maximum, definitely a spell worth, worth preparing for that situation. But just having it prepared normally all the time, probably not so much. On the other hand, Aura of Purity, I like quite a bit. And mostly it's because I can, again, have it prepared. And even if I don't use it at the start of the fight, because I don't necessarily know that these con conditions are going to be happening, the fact is a lot of these conditions allow a saving throw every round. And giving your allies advantage on the saving throws can help them pass. So I'll read it really quickly because it is a Paladin spell, traditionally not a cleric spell, you might not be as familiar with it. Uh, basically you have an aura of 30 feet, until the spell ends the aura moves with you and is centered on you. Each non-hostile creature in the aura, including you, can't become diseased, has resistance to poison damage, and has advantage on saving throws against effects that cause any of the following conditions. Blinded, charmed, deafened, frightened, paralyzed, poisoned, and stunned. And that's a big list of conditions, and like I said, a lot of things like, um, a lot of paralyzed or frightened type of conditions will allow a saving throw at the end of every round. And if your allies can make that saving throw with advantage, it's just a lot more likely they're not gonna get shut down for two or three or four rounds of the fight. You know, they'll be able to make that saving throw, get back in the fight, and it's, you know, a lot better. And like I said, you can use it retroactively, basically. It's like, oh, he failed, I'm gonna use the spell and help him pass it, you know. Pretty good for that. Uh, moving on to level 5, and I'm going to start the list with another spell I'm going to read, <laughs> which is Contagion. And Contagion is just an amazing spell, and I don't think I've ever seen anybody at my table ever cast it. So clearly that means I need to have some NPC clerics that cast it on the party, and uh, then they'll start seeing how good it is. Because <laughs> it is a great spell. Or maybe I don't want them to know how good it is, I don't know. Um, there are a few limitations. It 
is a touch spell. You have to make a melee spell attack against the creature. But there are some really nice things too. When they get hit, you afflict it with one disease of your choice. There's six different things you can afflict it with, right? And at the end of each of, they don't get a saving throw right away. At the end of each of their turns, they must make a constitution saving throw. If they fail three, the disease lasts for seven days. <laughs> if they pass three, the disease effect ends. But even if they have, like say, legendary saves, that means that they don't get to just make a saving throw and ignore the spell. The spell takes effect, and then they have to make a saving throw. If they fail, they have to use a legendary save, if they want to, right? And then they have to make another saving throw the next round. Like they have to pass three or fail three, whichever one happens first, right? Before the spell is either, you know, seven days duration or ending prematurely. And that's really, really powerful. You're at least guaranteed some actions before this thing's able to pass. And that's before we even get into the status effects, which are excellent. So you have blinding sickness, filth fever, flesh rot, mind fire, seizure, and slimy doom. I'll read uh, flesh rot and slimy doom the last because they're the two best. So bear in mind, these first four are the weaker of the effects. Uh, blinding sickness. Pain grips the creature's mind and his eyes turn milky white. It has disadvantage on wisdom checks and wisdom saving throws and is blinded. Uh, filth fever. A raging fi uh, fever, I almost said fire. Fever sweeps through the creature's body. The creature has disadvantage on strength checks, strength saving throws, and attack rolls that use strength. Uh, that's 90% of the monster manual right there. Uh, flesh rot. Oh, sorry, we'll get into that one last. Uh, mind fire. The creature's mind becomes feverish. The creature has disadvantage on intelligence checks, intelligence saving throws, and behaves as if it was under the effects of a confusion spell during combat. Pretty handy. Seizure. The creature is overcome with shaking. The creature has disadvantage on dexterity checks, dexterity saving throws, and attack rolls that use dexterity. Then we have Flesh Rot and Slimy Doom. Flesh Rot. The creature's flesh decays. The creature has disadvantage on charisma checks and has vulnerability to all damage. Vulnerability to all damage. So all your party's damage is doubled. Like that is just an amazing boss killing ability. <laughs> it is absolutely sick. And it's not the best. The best is Slimy Doom. Uh, the creature begins to bleed uncontrollably. The creature is disadvantaged on constitution checks, don't forget. Uh, constitution saving throws, and it's a constitution saving throw to end the effect. And in addition, whenever the creature takes damage, it is stunned until the end of its next turn. That, that spell is absolutely godly. <laughs> it is just absolutely sickening. It is so good. And like I said, I hardly ever see anybody in my party use it. But, uh, that spell is amazing. Anyways, continuing on. Uh, the spell Evil and Good, or Good and Evil, I think it actually is. Decent self buff. Um, it's not a bad spell by any means, although you could have been casting Contagion. Uh, but still pretty good. I don't mind it. Mass Cure Wounds, pretty handy as a mass healing type of, type of spell. If you need to heal a lot of people in a, in a hurry and you can't really afford to use Aura Vitality and, you know, hand out little heals here, there, and everywhere. Then Mass Cure Wounds is pretty good. Raise Dead, better version of Revivify, nothing wrong with that. Uh, scrying, more divination spells are always nice. I use divination spells quite a bit. I, I think they're really powerful. But, you know, depends on your DM in some cases and your campaign. Uh, greater Restoration, it's another one that you can probably prepare after you've realized you need it and don't necessarily have to have it ready, which is fine, nothing wrong with that. Insect Plague. Uh, the damage isn't great, like 4 to 10 piercing, although it does scale decently, an extra d10 per level. There's the same sort of half damage. But the main thing is, it has a range of 300 feet, it's an AoE spell, and it's persistent damage. There's also like a, a light obscurement effect, I think, as well, which isn't, you know, super huge, but could be handy. But mostly like a 300 foot range on a persistent AoE damage spell. Oh, it's also difficult terrain. So, not bad at all. Um, 
Holy Weapon, this is one that uh, I never really cast it on myself, even if I'm like a war clerk or something. Because by the time I have 5th level spells, I probably have like, you know, a fighter or a paladin or somebody else, a barbarian or somebody else in the party who's hitting a lot harder and a lot more consistently. And buffing him is going to be a lot better. Plus, it's going to make that guy really happy too when he gets a bunch of extra damage. And by the time you're level 11, like a fighter could be attacking three times around. I mean, or, or more even. You know, maybe you have a fighter who's level 11 and has pull on mastery. Now he's making three attacks plus a bonus action attack. And that holy weapon damage is just getting applied on every single hit. And uh, that is awesome. So it is a very, very nice DPS boost for certain party members. Um, obviously, like I said, I, even on War Cleric, I'm probably not going to use it on myself that much. I probably have someone else that's going to be better for it. But great spell either way. And then also from Tasha's, we have Summon Celestial. And I've done a lot of videos before already on like different summoning spells and stuff and different classes of summoners and stuff. And I just kind of like the summoning play style. I think it's pretty fun. But I really like this summoning spell from Tasha's because a lot of the previous ones, it was either like you get to choose what they are or maybe the DM gets to choose what they are. And then it's like different CR levels and you're going through the book trying to find, you know, what spell is going to summon what creatures and you know, whatever, right? I like the ones in Tasha's where basically each summoning spell has its own stat block for that creature associated with it. They scale quite nicely. They get like proficiency bonus equal to yours. You know, a lot of times their attacks per round might scale to get more hit points, etc., etc. And it's just a lot more streamlined. It's like, I want to cast Summon Celestial. Boom. There's a spell. There's the stat block for what I get. What spell level am I choosing to cast it at? That's going to be the only thing that changes, right? And then it's going to adjust its stats slightly accordingly. But either way, Summon Celestial is pretty good. You've got some decent options there too. Um, not a bad spell by any means. So those are my thoughts on the cleric spells of 3rd, 4th, and 5th level. I'm sure that I've missed some good ones that other people are going to comment on. That's fine. But, uh, you know, feel free to like, subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, all that stuff. And most importantly, leave me your comments in the comment section. Maybe you had a time where you used some spell to clever effect, like Gulf of Warding or whatever, and you managed to use it and killed a bunch of stuff, and it was excellent. I love reading that kind of stuff, you know? Maybe you have some spells you think I should have included, or some that you think I overrated. That's fine, too. So let me know. I love reading everybody's comments. So, that's everything I have for this video, and I will see you next time. Bye.